Yes, yes, this is Mr. Controversy, and this is the infamous Three Point Conversion Station. Keep it locked. The coast representing all of the dog pound. This is the Brownstown USA podcast powered by the three point conversion. The three point conversion where fans' opinions matter. I'm Eric, and over on the east side of Ohio, I believe, is LA Baratis. LA, what can you tell me about what's going on? Over in the land near several lakes. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Uh, there's a lot going on this morning, and we'll definitely dive into that. We have a huge show um, today. We're going to talk about what's going on with our week, of course, with you guys. We're going to wrap up some thoughts from this Chiefs game that we just had. Um, what's trending with the Browns? Some big injury news that we just got, unfortunately, before we went on air. Um, our player of the game, doggy bag, and uh, what we need to do to try to beat these this high-powered offense going up against the Falcons. So definitely appreciate everybody for joining us every single week to hear us out. Uh, definitely appreciate the, the love. And make sure you follow Brownstown USA on Twitter at Brownstown USA and also check out our Facebook group page, Brownstown USA. We are getting bigger and talking more and more about the Browns, especially with all the new shakeups that are going on inside of the organization. So, Eric. Yo. What's been going on this week, man? Honestly, I've been counting down the days on my calendar to this Wednesday. It's still morning, I guess. For those that don't know, we are recording on a Wednesday, mainly because... I'm starting to get sick of the political talk, to be honest, because election day is over. I understand how big it is, and I was telling people to go out and vote. I didn't care who they voted for. Just do it. But at the end of the day, it's just like it's a relief because it's like, okay, it's done. Let's get down to the let's get down to sports again. Let normal life resume, if you will. Understood, understood. Um, I don't really get too much into the political talk, even though I know that with your job, that's kind of like your thing. But uh, good to see everybody out there exercising their right and doing their thing. Um, My week, Eric, has been I started uh, this show called Ray Donovan. Yeah, I heard that. I saw your post about that. How is it? Yeah, it's actually really, really good. I'm very impressed so far. I'm only four episodes in, but so far it has definitely caught my attention. So I will, I guess, be back later, uh, maybe next week or the week before to kind of give my expert opinion on the show. But, yeah, it's definitely something to check out, guys, if you are out there looking for some new shows to uh, to dive into. Other than that, Eric, uh, going back and forth on Twitter – well, not going back and forth, but – I got tagged in a nice little Twitter argument between two guys uh, mm. with the Des Bryant stuff. Um, if people didn't know, he is in negotiations with the Saints. Um, haven't seen anything official yet, but in negotiations with them, with them, and somebody put out a tweet talking about how he, uh, they were happy for him. He had plenty of offers on the table that the media wasn't privy to. So I said, you know, hey we knew that he had offers on the table and he was like, well, no, he had multiple offers more than the two then that, you know, I wrote about and reported on. And I said, Hey, look, you know, if you are privy to more information, cool. I just, you know, we just report what we know. So then all of a sudden a whole bunch of people jumped in saying, no, he didn't. You're just making this stuff up, uh, talking to the other guy. And now they're just like battling. So I woke up to like 20 missed notifications on my Twitter because or actually more than 20 because of the fact that they're going back and forth arguing. So 
that is fun and always good when you get into uh, arguments with people that don't have a profile picture on Twitter. So, oh, do you mean like uh, Tony Grossi? Just kidding. <laughs> but anyways, um, you know, it's interesting that in this age of technology, we're willing to start a fight with someone that we think is smart enough to do this type of stuff that knows exactly what's going on when the reality is they're just some homer that doesn't understand how a contract works or a contract negotiation, or they're just some seven-year-old that because it worked in Madden means that it wor- it'll work in real life. So it's funny, but it is what it is. True that, true that. Well, getting on to real things in life <laughs> – we have some things that are trending with the Browns right now. Um, actually, no. Before we go into what's trending, we got to talk about this Chiefs game, man. Uh, because we kind of condensed our show, guys. We uh used to do like a, a post game show and a preview game, but we kind of condensed it all together to give you one action packed show. So we haven't had a chance to really get out there and talk about this Chiefs game like how we wanted to. Eric, I'm gonna let you lead the way here. What did you think about this Chiefs game? What stuck out to you? Well, let me start off by saying, when we did the preview, we weren't expecting to win. What I will say, though, is, and I know we're tired of moral victories, this was the biggest moral victory game that we could have expected, though. Look, I think a lot of people were expecting us to be blown out, like, by at least 20 points. We only lost by two possessions, and there was a lot to really go off of. I mean, very low penalties compared to where we were in the Jackson administration. So far, so far, anything can happen. Greg Robinson showed up and showed maybe he should be starting at left tackle. We'll have to wait and see. Right now on the depth chart, he is the lead guy. But the thing is, This was a game that showed us that there is some hope with this team this season, that maybe we can get at least two or three more victories. The Hugh Jackson administration, I don't know if that would have been the case just because, well, because of just the butting heads that we had. Yeah. I was very impressed with the with the amount of penalties that I was down. Um, I, I want to say I think we had like four total. And the team looked different when it came out there, which we knew it would. We called that they would get infused with a, with a shot of energy. Anytime you make a big change like that, you, you know, the team is going to respond normally in a positive nature. The thing that I will say that stuck out to me the most is – Baker Mayfield this game, even though I liked some throws that he does, there's still some things about him that still screams out rookie, okay? And it's nothing bad. It's not a knock on him. He is a rookie. I get it. But there were some throws that I was kind of scratching my head like, man, why did you why did you make that throw? And he also leaves you with that tendency to want to force stuff because he's so used to winning – He's that comeback kid kind of guy. So it seems like he's out there and he's doing too much at times instead of letting the game come to him. And that's kind of what I've seen from this game. Let's be honest, Eric. You know, we've had – we got banged up and and we are very banged up on the defensive side. So I knew that defensively we might be able to do some things against them, but we ultimately weren't going to be able to stop one of the most potent offenses in the NFL. So what that did is that put pressure on the offense to score more, which is something that has not been our strength this year. So it looked like Baker, you know, Mahomes would come down there, they would score, he would Mahomes would make it look easy. And then now Baker has that pressure to go ahead and put up a TD as well, along with all the competitive juices flowing from him and just Patrick Mahomes going back and forth back in college. I just think that Baker was forcing it. Absolutely. And in that kind of situation you are, I also don't think going for it on fourth down almost every time, as well as going for two point conversions every time is really helping either. I mean, the one nice thing is we got to see 
Baker spread the ball more. I mean, the past few weeks we've seen he and him try to force it to Landry or force it to, to be honest, really it was only Landry because whenever it was thrown to any other receiver, they dropped it as well, except for maybe Najoku, but even he had drops. The fact is, this was the first time I think we saw Baker really spread the ball out. Very true. <clears throat> and, and Baker did spread it out a lot. Uh, of course, it was really good to see Rashard Higgins back out there. It was also good to see, um, you know, Rashard Perriman. We, we we were able to see a couple catches from him, and he looked really good. I can remember a play that he did where he had, like, maybe a 15, 20-yard scamper um, by making some nice cuts. And Njoku, of course, had a couple of nice catches as well, like how we know he can. Eric, the, the big thing, too, man, that just keeps – glaring as this this big giant red light is that the the line now I kind of feel that Greg Robinson came in and did a very good job replacing Desmond Harrison and so I want to get your thoughts real quick before we go and um and and take a break but what did you think about Greg Robinson coming in um at that left tackle position do you feel like Desmond Harrison should come back in and reclaim his job do you feel like they should maybe move Desmond Harrison over to the right tackle and I mean, you know, or vice versa, but have them two anchor in the tackles and see how that works out. How do you feel about that? Honestly, I think um, we could probably do one or the other. I mean, either way, I think Greg Robinson did earn a job somewhere here. I mean, a lot of people are saying, well, we just signed Chris Hubbard. Hubbard didn't really do that. Not that he didn't do well. He just didn't live up to what, People were putting for an expectation was the big problem. The thing with Harrison is he's looked good, but maybe we can try him over at right tackle a little bit. I mean, look, left and right tackles are two completely different positions. People don't understand that because usually the left tackle is to protect the quarterback, if I remember correctly, while the right tackle is more to protect the running back. So in any case, if you want to give and if they want to give it a shot, I think that could be in the best interest of the team. You just have to make that distinction right now though. Not put it off, put it off, put it off like what we saw at the beginning of the year when our original depth chart was saying Joe Batonio was the left tackle and then the the Friday before, oh, it's uh Harrison. Got you. So, again, before we transition over Real quick, who was your player of this game? Player of the game? You know what? I'm going to be honest with you. It's the offense as a whole because the fact is, while we did not look good, we did not look great, the offense looked more disciplined, and they were able to, do, they were able to produce. So I can't give it to one guy. I got to give it to that whole offense. That's fair. Um, I'm going to go ahead, though, and give my player the game to somebody that we haven't really even talked about unless we're screaming to use him more. And I got to give a humongous shout-out to Duke Johnson, man. I saw it coming. Yeah, look, you know, I tweeted about it. I was very excited about it last night. But come on, guys. This was a no-brainer. You finally got him back involved in the offense. He looks just as good as he's always looked, and I am looking forward to Frank Kitchens getting him more involved in this offense. And the more we get Duke Johnson involved, the more the more that it's going to spell out for good for everybody else. I mean, think about it. Duke Johnson out there catching um, passes. I believe he actually led the team in catches this week. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that that's a, that's a fact. Um, let me look it up real quick. I'm at the box score real quick. Yeah. Um, Duke Johnson led the team with, I want to say, nine receptions. Yeah, nine receptions. And the next closest was Jarvis Landry at six. So that's a good thing. He had nine receptions, 78 yards, and two touchdowns. That's the kind of stuff that we want to see from that guy, and that's what we know that he's capable of. And then when he gets loose, that allows everybody else to get loose, like Nick Chubb, who did okay. Didn't have the best average as far as running, but, you know, was still able to get into the end zone and also have 85 yards on the ground. So let's just keep getting this guy – just keep getting this guy involved, man. Let's keep getting him – let's keep getting him the ball. 
So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what's trending with the Browns currently and get into some major injury news. This is Brownstown, USA, powered by three-point conversion. Be right back. All three tight ends out wide left. Duke Johnson and Landry near side to the right. From the Kansas City 5, Mayfield in the shotgun on third down and goal. The Chiefs all up on the line, and they throw it left side for Duke Johnson. Caught it and goes in for another touchdown. Three seconds into the fourth quarter. And we are back. This is Brownstown, USA. Powered by the three-point conversion, I'm L.A., and across from me is my main man, Eric, and we are breaking everything down for you guys. We just talked about the Chiefs game last week, and now we are going to hop into what's trending with our Browns this week. So, Eric, of course, with the firing of Hugh Jackson, everybody was interested in who may take his place. So, the guy that came out and the guy that has the most buzz and most, most steam around him, and we've talked about it pretty much almost every day. We've been screenshotting and sending stuff to each other about it is Bruce Arians. So Bruce Arians came out and said that if he were to come out of retirement, the Browns job would be the only job that he would come out for. He's very enamored with us and and, and just loves the city of Cleveland, loves the fans, loves the team, loves what John Dorsey's doing. I mean, just gave us all high praises all the way around. So Eric, how do you feel about Bruce? How do you feel about his comments as far as coming out and saying it at this point in time in the season? Like, do you, do you think it might be too soon? Um, do, do you think the Browns should pull the trigger on this? Look, I like the idea of Bruce Arians. I know that we've gone back and forth like, yeah, he'd be great to have. And then, no, I don't want him. But let me be honest, guy's a really good coach. And I know that people are saying no retreads. In today's NFL, there are two there are two types of coaches out there. You either have, I mean, in terms of success, you either have the young whiz kid, if you will, the Sean McVeighs, the what Doug Petersons. You have those guys, or you have the coach that was not very successful the first time, or had some success, but never really got to that next level, a.k.a. the Pete Carrolls, the Bill Belichicks, and and, a less, and I believe also the coach of the Colts, I want to say. I might be wrong. Oh, no, no, sorry. Arians? What? Arians? You said Arians? Yeah, yeah. Arians yeah, never yeah. – Yeah, yeah he, was, he was interim coach when, um, when Pagano went down. Yeah, and then, of course, he had the Cardinals job for, for the longest time as well. Yep. So the thing is, I think that if you're Cleveland, he should, I mean, put a star next to his name just to see if he's actually really serious about it. And then just connect with him and just see what you can pick from the guy because he's a brilliant football mind. The thing is, you want to make sure that he can either be an advisor or a coach. Just have him do something, though. He clearly loves Cleveland and has wanted the job for really since he was let go after uh, Butch Davis was fired. Yeah, and an interesting thing that I was picking up off of um, off of radio the other day is they said that he still has a, a Cleveland number, so a two one six number. Never changed it. He um, he also was very very like crushed because he had interviewed for the job before and they said that he was really livid that he didn't get the job. So I really think that he's not playing. I mean, the interest is definitely there, but this will lead up to what else is trending with the Browns as well, Eric. And there was a report that was released where, um, dang, I can't remember the reporter's name off the top of my head, but he went through and he was in Cleveland for the last, like say four days or a week before Hugh Jackson was let go. He reported a lot of different things around the the Hugh situation, but he also said, too, that Haslam has not confirmed anything with Dorsey or gave him any kind of guarantees that he would let Dorsey conduct the head coaching search. 
Eric, when when I heard that, my blood started boiling. I'm not going to lie to you because we've seen what coaches look like when Haslam hires them. Hugh Jackson was a Haslam hire. And how do you bring a guy in and say, hey, I trust you to run my franchise with all this other stuff, and then when it comes to the head coach, I'm going to pick him and go over you. We've seen this before. We've seen – I mean, we look, it's not rocket science. It's the NFL. You get your GM. Your GM picks his head coach. And the head coach fills out his staff. What the heck is so wrong with this? And like I said, again, this is a rumor. So it's, it's not been confirmed or denied. And we've seen Haslam not really answer it as much as he could have in the press conference. But, Eric, I mean, if this happens again, dude, I mean, like, where do we go from there? Where, where do we go from here? If this happens again, then there's only one thing you can really think about. And that is is Dorsey really in charge? I mean, look, it, I mean, it appeared Dorsey was in charge about this, at this point last week when he was, when he was gone, Greg was instilled as head coach, but that's not the, but that's, that's, that's the past. Now we have to realize that right now, if this is going to happen, then we're probably going to see Jimmy Haslam become the next Jerry Jones, just minus the Super Bowl rings. We could end up seeing this turn into the Jimmy Haslam show, where he's a pu- where he's the puppeteer with his little puppet with future GM Paul De Podesta and whoever his puppet of a head coach is. The same way that Jason Garrett's a puppet for Jerry Jones. And you know what? This is the last thing Cleveland needs. The fact of the matter is, the product isn't unwatchable. Two years ago, the product was unwatchable. Last year, it was slightly watched and watchable. This year, it's completely watchable. We can't one thing is this. mess with the team, though. My thing is this. Jimmy Haslam cannot be the Jerry Jones, okay? We don't have the destination... You know, Dallas Cowboys, they can still get a couple of free agents there just based off of their name, even though it is a complete crap show. When Cle- when Cleveland is a crap show, nobody's going there. I mean, we overpay free agents. It's just completely, as they say, a, a factory of sadness. We can't – we don't have that luster to bring people to us like how you can and in, in, at Dallas. And – I'm telling you right now, like, if if Haslam does indeed hire the head coach over Dorsey and not take any of his recommendations, I don't. I think Dorsey is that strong of a mind that he's going to be pissed off. And if Dorsey leaves, he's going to take all that front office with him, and then we're going to be right back to where we are. And if that happens, Eric, I'm looking. At, we're looking at a full, just revolution, just a mutiny. For the city of Cleveland, I already know that they that Haslam will not be able to step anywhere. We will see all kinds of petitions everywhere. We'll see GoFundMe accounts being raised to get Haslam out of there. It's going to be pandemonium. So, for 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 whatever, I'm just holding on to a sliver of hope and saying, Haslam, please step back. I understand. Look, look, and and I know most people say to owners, hey, just sign the checks. No, that's not what good businessmen do. They are involved at some point, and they want that final stamp of approval. I am okay with that. But I do not want him out there going and actively conducting the head coaching search. That is not what you should do, man. Sit back. Let the team run itself. That's what you brought Dorsey in for. Let, let, them, let the money, you know, let it, let it make it. Make, let the money do it without you even having any involvement in it because we've seen – the track record that you that you have, and it's just been disastrous. So that's where I'm at on that. But we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back. We have some big injury news for you guys. And um, and then we're going to talk about – actually, we should – almost doggy bag time, man. We're flying through this show. So this is Brownstown USA, powered by the three-point conversion. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cat Williams, and you are listening to Three Point Conversion Radio. Hey, 
And we are back. I'm L.A. And across from me is Eric. We just got done talking about what was trending with the Browns, Bruce Arians, and maybe Haslam still not getting the point of stock meddling in the head coaching business. But be that as it may, Eric, we have some big injury news. Why don't you let us know, man, what, what, what we got on the table there? Well, it's a very serious injury right now. Um, We saw EJ, as part of the onslaught that we had this past weekend, not only did we lose a lot of players before the game, during the game, Denzel Ward got hurt. No update on him yet, I believe. You heard anything or no? Still nothing on Denzel Ward yet. Uh, we – yeah, I, I think we should know more today uh, because um, Greg Williams should be talking and then the practice starts back up today, but still nothing out on Denzel Ward yet. But the two big ones, EJ Gaines, done for the year. Christian Kirksey, done for the year. So now you just lost another experienced cornerback for the year while you're waiting on – TJ on I'm, I'm Mitchell to come back. And then you just lost essentially the lifeline of your defense and Christian Kirksey. Meaning that the man in charge is Jamie Collins. Yeah. Yeah, Jamie is in charge, and I know that um, Greg Williams came out and, and, and endorsed him a, a lot. But And I think he led the team in tackles last week with seven. I think, if I'm not mistaken, we should be getting some news to hear about Schobert coming back, hopefully. Uh, this has been, what, his third, second, third week that he's been, you know, out. So, hopefully – we get some good news with him coming back. Kirksey hurts, definitely. EJ Gaines, I'm not surprised that he's going back on the IR or that he's going on the IR. I mean, that's two concussions, like, within the same week. I mean, he just came back from being in concussion protocol, and then, boom, gets another concussion. So that definitely hurts the secondary. We're crossing our fingers for the Denzel Ward, though, man. That That's a, that's a big one there. And like I said, we just keep getting banged up on the defense, and that's been our bread and butter this season. So. I'm uh I'm hoping for good news here, crossing my fingers, and um, you know we'll know more later on, and we'll tweet we'll make sure we tweet that out um for you guys on the Brownstown USA Twitter account. So, Eric, uh, as always, with the fans love, you reach over into that doggy bag, and you know the doggy bag is basically a segment where we answer questions from you, the fans. And the cool part about Doggy Bag is that it's actually sponsored by RealtorProMedia.com. So make sure you hop over to RealtorProMedia.com. It is a fantastic service for all of our realtors and people trying to sell their houses and, and buy houses. But you can hop on there and check it out and look at amazing videos and layouts of all the houses and stuff like that. And, you know, it's a good service, man. Something different. Something different for you but realtorpromedia.com. Make sure you check it out. So, Eric, we know that you like to reach around in that bag and pull out random stuff. So what do you got for us this week? Uh, let's see what we – oh, cool. I found a contract for hair and shoulders, and written on the back of it is an insurance policy. <laughs> I'm pretty... Okay, this might be the uh, Pittsburgh bag. Ew, it smells bad, too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you feel we'll do in the remaining division games? For those that don't know, it's Baltimore one more time, then we have both games with Cincinnati. L.A., I got to ask. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> <laughs> That's confident. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, look. AFC North games are always played tight. I, I have a feeling that we can be in some of these games, but just the way that – well, you know what? The Ravens are actually trending – well, they always do weird stuff. So th 
we we could have a chance. We could have a chance. I I actually said, Eric, just like I think you alluded to earlier in this show, that I could see the Browns maybe winning two more games. So, it oh, it would have to maybe come out of this here. Uh, maybe go ahead and get a win against Baltimore and a win against Cincinnati, but it's gonna be tough. Yeah, like my thing is. I do think that we can beat Baltimore and we could sweep them. It's just something about Baltimore that you don't trust with them. Cincinnati, I have a weird feeling that we're either going to split or we're going to lose both games. We're we're not going to sweep them just because as much as we want to say that they're they're a garbage team, they're really good this year. They are perhaps the team that could win this division if it's not for the Steelers. So I feel eh, like I think we could go 500 or we could go two for three or we could go one for three or we could go 0 for three. We're not going three for three, though. Yeah, very true. Very true. Next question I got. Why hasn't the front office addressed the crisis at wide receiver? Why didn't they go after Cooper or... Okay, that's got to be a misprint. Watson. I don't know any receivers named Watson, but okay. Sammy? Okay, I don't think he was up for any kind of move, though. But anyways, the status quo has us leading the league in drops. If the point of the season is to help Baker develop, why did we stand patent in an obvious area of need? Simple. We didn't want to give up a trade pick for a rental. Yeah, I got I got to agree with that. And the remaining wide receivers out there just weren't nothing to really, you know, gush over. And, I mean, we like I said, we, we said this last week, we seen wide receivers go for a third round, a fourth round and then even a first round, which was hilarious. But we've seen receivers go for all over the board. I think everybody that was willing to move their wide receivers, they got the deal that they wanted. Now, I'm not going to say the Browns weren't in discussion and maybe didn't have any offers because I did hear whispers there that they were on the phones and making it happen, which is what Dorsey does. But other teams just came in and scooped up. And the more desperate teams out there this this season – if you look at the trade deadline was the guys that were actually making a push towards the Super Bowl and they were willing to give up whatever it took in order to get them to win that Super Bowl. And I actually feel that, you know, with everything that was going on in the Browns organization, that it was good to go ahead and just stand pat, stand pat with the guys that you got. We have some talent there. Uh, even be that as a may, even though, you know, people are injured, but I, I like what Rashard Higgins is doing. Again, we just mentioned that uh, Perryman is, is is starting to show some flashes, and if he can get there, I mean, he can potentially be our deep threat along with Antonio Callaway here and there. Uh, but that's what we had, man, for right now. You don't really see that many end-season trades. And if we would have made an end-season trade, it really wouldn't have done anything for our overall season, you know? And that's really what it boiled down to. Was, it, was the risk better than what we were going to get the, was it greater than the reward that we were going to get in return? And that's what I feel like why we didn't pull the trigger. Absolutely. Not to mention, when you talk about an in-season trade, it only happens when a team is either really trying to sell or is really trying to buy. And usually when a team is really trying to buy, it's because they're either in a very close arms race. Like, for example, Josh, in the Josh Gordon trade, if you remember that one, as much as people don't want to think about it, look at where the Patriots were. People were thinking they were going to lose to the Dolphins in that division. And they very well could have because Julian Edelman was not playing. Gronkowski, as good as he is, teams were triple teaming him. The fact is, you have to realize it only, a trade only happens when it makes sense. This isn't NFL head coach where you can just trade somebody and be like, oh, look at how good it worked out. Because there's a good chance it won't work out at all. Absolutely. All right. What else you got in that bag, man? Uh, Let's see. Here's a very intriguing one. 
Do you do you guys think that Bruce Arians is really a chance in Cleveland? And then right afterwards, Bill Cowher question mark. Uh, look, we we've had a love hate relationship with Bill Cowher. I don't know. He looks really cushy in that in that job. So I'm not sure where his level of interest is as far as still coaching. No, I will not refuse him if he comes back. But I just don't know. I don't know, man. Like, I I really don't know. Like, Bruce Arians very very much intrigues me. He's like my leading coaching candidate right now. I love the guy. I love his resume. I love what he was able to do with Kansas City. And, again, like you said, Kansas – or, sorry, not Kansas City. Arizona. It was Arizona. Arizona. I'm sorry. I always get them too uh, mixed up. But, um, but yeah, so I love what he was able to do in Arizona. It's very hard to do that in Arizona. So, but uh, – and then also, too, think about it, dude. With him being in Arizona, he's worked with a wide receiver like Larry Fitzgerald, who is, is sort of like – Jarvis Landry, you know, not the fastest guy, but, you know, possession. I mean, I, it looks like he know, he should know what to do with this offense if he were to come in. So I, I'm more intrigued with Bruce Arians than I am with Bill Cowher. Here's the thing. I heard the Cowher interview. I believe I sent it over to you. Yeah. The thing about the Cowher interview that I think people are really overlooking with this, he, I don't think he was talking about himself at all. He was saying – the next Cleveland coach has to go in with that mindset. That's a lot different than him saying it personally. So I don't think Cowher's leaving. I mean, he's also really up there in age, I believe. I don't know how old he is really, but I thought he was at least in his 70s. 66. 66. Okay, so yeah. same age as Arian. So I stand corrected. Now, Who, oh, Cowher? You mean Cowher? Yeah, Cower. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know how old he is off the top yeah. of my head. Yeah, like Bill Cower, he's been in the league forever. Let's be honest. I mean, just going to take a quick little peek, see if there's anything about how old he is. Uh, right now he is – he's 61. So he's got years left, but at the same time, I don't think he's leaving because he's already he has nothing left to prove at this point. Sure. Arians, on the other hand, he does have a lot to prove. He didn't win a Super Bowl. He never led his team to the Super Bowl. He's been a coach in the Super Bowl. He's been an assistant in the Super Bowl, and he's won a championship as an assistant. That doesn't define a legacy, though. That won't. It could put you in the Hall of Fame, but Arians wants to, and wants to be the guy in Cleveland. He's showing that interest. I think Arians is the more realistic possibility. That especially since you know who we'd probably keep as the offensive coordinator. Yeah. So yeah. I think you have that plus just look at the pedigree that Arians has worked with. Carson Palmer, borderline Hall of Famer, Peyton Manning Future Hall of Famer, um, Andrew Luck, would be a Hall of Famer if it wasn't for his injuries. I mean, he still has time too, but that yeah. you know that's beside the point. But and anywho, that, yeah, but you get what I'm getting at. The guys worked with more quarterbacks that have the potential to be Hall of Famers. He's worked with probably some of the greatest wide receivers of all time as well. If he wants to come to Cleveland, Jimmy, get the checkbook open. And for God's sakes, shut your damn mouth and don't piss him off. That's all I'm going to say. All right. So, does Bryant News now it's official one-year deal with the Saints, which we've seen that coming. But, so. You know what? There's one good news out of this. People can now shut the hell up about him coming to Cleveland. Thank God. That's true. Way to look at it positively. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, thank you again. Our fan of the week this week is Corey Robinson. So thank you, sir, for doing your thing in Brownstown, USA, the Facebook group. If you would like to get shouted out as the fan of the week, make sure you go into the group, comment, 
contribute, post, whatever you see, man, Browns related. I know that me and Eric pretty much cover a lot of the news, but, I mean, you can too. It's not a problem. We we do not shoot people down for double posts or anything crazy like that. We just allow it to fry, fly freely in Brownstown, USA. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show of what we must do against these Falcons to get a win. Dirty birds! <laughs> This is Brownstown, USA, powered by the three-point conversion. We'll be right back. Mayfield under center. Wants the crowd to quiet. Underneath center, first and goal. Takes the snap. Gives it left side. Chuck dancing. Coming. Going in. Touchdown, Let's go. Nick Chubb. And we are back, Brownstown, USA. And I am L.A. And across from me is Eric. And, um, Eric, I am sorry. I'm just putting up this Des Bryant news for the three-point conversion. But, um. Let's talk about these Falcons that we got to face, man. What must we do to get a win against the Falcons? Look, this isn't – the one nice thing about the Falcons right now is this is not the same Falcons team that went to the the Super Bowl against the Patriots. That Falcons team was unstoppable when you get down to it. This one, not so much. Believe it or not – if we're going to beat the Falcons, the one thing we're going to have to do on defense, we're going to have to play the pass very well. Look, the the Falcons' running attack is not what it used to be. Their running attack is 29th in the NFL right now. Let that sink in. 29th in the NFL, the Falcons, who have a former rookie of the year there, and then Freeman, who's not looking the same anymore so we can actually be I mean, as long as we can stop the pass because julio jones can burn us let's be honest here julio jones could kill us matt ryan can kill us but if we can stop the pass unlike what we did we don't have to worry too much about the run when in terms of defense yeah Looking at that, man, the Falcons, the thing that I'm afraid of, man, is their, is their passing attack. I I mean, with us being so banged up in the secondary, man, we have the potential to really, really get lit up. And that's, that's honestly what I'm afraid of. They threw up a bunch of points last week as well. And it looks like they were able to get Julio Jones back involved, which was something that was – that Falcons fans were just screaming about, like, why wasn't he involved? Um, so I think he w- we've seen a resurgence from him last week as well. I'm I'm afraid, man. Well, I'm, a, I'm afraid on that point. Well, considering that our defense hasn't been good really at all, here's a little bit of a silver lining for it, though. They have the 26 highest and worst passing and passing defense. You know who they're just ahead of? Tampa Bay. They're also just ahead of the Saints and Kansas City, who we kind of lit them up when you actually get down to it. I mean, we didn't score, but we were able to we were able to pass on the teams. Hell, New Orleans, we were able to pass on them with well, you know who. But the pro the thing is. The rushing defense is what we are going to need to be very careful of. They're 12th in stopping the run. So if we can at least get – if we can mix in passes very well the way we did last week, I think that offense could could actually make things interesting. The defense needs to sure itself up, especially on the pass, though, this week. That's the big thing. The strength and the offensive game plan, keep mixing the ball up. Be unpredictable. And then on de- and, and then the big thing we gotta work on, stop the passing yards, especially with Julio. Absolutely. Yeah. Who's your player that you'll be watching out for this week? The player I'm gonna be most watching out for is Duke Johnson. You know, and here's the thing. He had himself a nice game last week. This is his bread and butter type of game, though. We know Chubb's going to put up some good rushing numbers. 
we think that Landry could put up some pretty good receiving numbers. But all of that's going to detract from the fact that you have this guy that can do both. So if they can get Duke involved in the game early and often, if he, especially if he can get, let's say, 50-50, let's say, for yardage, if he can get more than that for yardage, well, call me Sally. It'll be good, but he's got to get more, he's got to get at least fifty fifty in this game. You know, the crazy thing is the guy I'm gonna be watching out for is gonna be Perriman. Uh, like I said, I, I think that he showed flashes last week. He has that still that speed that we are looking for from from that wide receiver position and. I'm hoping that he can get loose. Uh, we've seen Callaway and, you know, not contribute as much as we had hoped. But, again, he's a rookie wide receiver, and I can't be too down on him because we've seen over the past couple of years that rookie wide receivers don't come into the league and just torch it like that at first. They, It's a learning curve, and then, remember, you know, he hasn't been playing football for a while. So what he's doing is what is expected, but we've seen flashes of what he can be if he just buckles down and puts in the work. So I'm not really looking for that, but I am looking for Perryman to maybe step in and take that over for him and um, and go from there. Jarvis needs help, man, at that wide receiver position. He can't do it by himself. And it actually makes me mad because when you see Jarvis catch a pass, you always see him like do some spin move or some little juke out trying to get more yards. And a lot of times it doesn't work out for him, but – it's like he's trying to be Superman when he's out there on the field. And we need to be able to get that pressure off of him where he's not feeling like he has to do the most out there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, Jarvis, I know people are frustrated because they're thinking we spent a draft pick on this. Jarvis has been one of the, uh, I mean, like the best way to put it, they are saying this and then they're saying it also, yeah, this was the most overrated move we made. Are you kidding? This guy's been doing a lot for this team. He's Correct. Been, he's been an emotional leader. He's been the biggest support for Baker Mayfield. Let's be honest here. Jarvis plays much more of a role than anybody could. So, you know what? I'll even say this. He's been the one reliable thing that we've had. And not trying to take a shot at anybody here. If we didn't make this, if we didn't make that move, would you really trust Gordon to be that role? I don't know if I would, to be honest. Jarvis has been a huge part, no matter if you're talking about teaching the rookies like Callaway and Ratley, no matter if it's trying to be the guy that's firing up the team, <laughs> no matter if it's a guy beating up Mitchell in practice. He's gonna I and mean, he's done nothing but fire this team up. We need him. Very true. Very true. Now, it's time to go ahead and break it down, man. What's your score predictions? My score prediction is I do think the Falcons will get the better of us. However, I'm predicting another overtime game. I know, we're getting tired of these overtime games, but considering that so far we've sent both games of the a and of the NFC South into overtime and then lost because of well we should have won those get those two games already I'm gonna go ahead and say it I think this game ends 30 to 27 you said 30 to 27 yeah Whew. all right so Eric is picking that our offense can Produce those numbers again. Um, and this one, man, I'm going to go ahead and go Falcons 38, Browns 21. And, um, yeah, and I think it's going to be kind of like how the Chiefs did us, where it seemed like we were okay. We are going to kind of stick into the game, and then they'll start to wear us down. Uh we're just not good against screens or we're just not good at tackling. <laughs> so um, <laughs> there's too many playmakers over there for us. I mean, I really hope that they get this tackling down, but that's not something that you just 
do over a week in my concern. I, you know, they just don't tackle, man. They bounce off of people. So I think that's going to hurt us. We're, they're going to get a lot of yards after the catch just because of the fact that we can't tackle. So I see them pulling away late, 38-21. I could see it. Um, The big question, though, that could determine this game is some of this injury news. Like, if we get Randall back, if we get Ward back, then I think those are two of the big pieces that we're missing. Kirksey, we've played before. We've played very well, even without him at times. But we also had Schober and Collins. But you know what? If Co- I mean, now that Collins has a chance to show why we're paying him the big bucks, it also gives him an opportunity to show why he should stay to Cleveland because he's staying Cleveland. He's fighting for a career I and mean, for his job right now. If he can't show that leadership, I don't see. Uh, Dorsey holding on to him. That's true. So we shall see. But definitely want to thank everybody for joining us for another episode of Brownstown USA. We had fun this show, and we will continue to bring more Browns news to you. Like I said, make sure you follow us on Twitter at Brownstown USA, on the Facebook group at Brownstown USA. Also, as we told you, we like to thank the Three Point Conversion for powering our show, so make sure you follow Three Point Conversion. Their website, threepointconversion.com. Catch a lot of our work over there, amazing writers, team doing their thing. Uh, make sure you follow the Three Point Conversion on all your social media outlets, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all over the place, giving you the latest and greatest in, in, in sports news and updates. I'm L.A. Broadus. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at L.A. underscore Broadus. And across from me is my man, Eric. And you can follow him on Twitter at Stoshball or on Instagram at I underscore am underscore Stoshball. We'd like to thank our sponsor as well, RealtorProMedia.com. So make sure you hop over there and check that out, especially if you're in the market for a house or trying to sell a house. We got you covered. So, Eric, that's it. That's it, but you know what? Let's show. I, mean, I want to actually do one thing to send this show out with a bang because it worked last time with that weird out of nowhere rant. Oh, real quick um, injury update Denzel Ward, Jamie Collins, and JC Treader are not practicing. Ward and Collins are on a bike right now. So not a bad sign. Uh, we probably could get Ward when they're on the bike. I mean, it's 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 okay. So, yeah. but if they're just not completely participating, then that's where you kind of have that uh, that scare. So Ward and Collins are on the bike right now during practice. So that's a that's a decent sign. Okay. So last time it worked because we were looking for an ending for the show, and it seemed like a rant was the right idea at the time. So let's try it again. Feel free to call me an idiot at any point, L.A. I am giving you permission to do that. Okay. put a minute, Do me a favor. Put a minute on the clock. Oh, wait. And then Joe Strobert, Damaris Randall, and Harrison are all back to practicing. Oh, wow. Here we go. Okay. All right. So, ready? So put a minute on the clock. We're going to end the show this way. All right, your minute is set. One, two, three, and go. Guys, stop thinking that we can win the division right now. We are trying to prove that we can at least compete without winning the division. The division, bye-bye division. No one gives a damn anymore. Steelers can have the division. But you know what? I would rather fight for the future right now, I would rather prove we can be better than the damn Bengals. Come on, let's do it. We have the team to do it, but we are not going for the division. Forget about the division. Bye-bye, division. Bye-bye. Here we come, future. The future is now. We got a quarterback. We got a running back. Come on. Fight for the future. All righty. And you did that with 10 seconds to spare, man. Good job. All right. <laughs>
<laughs> this is Brad, this is the Brownstown USA podcast, powered by the three point conversion. Where fans' opinions matter. We will see you next week. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know? Your ass better call somebody.